Hi everybody, let's now consider another really important labour market imperfection, that of trade unions and how they distort efficient, competitive labour market outcomes. Let's start by understanding what a trade union actually is. A trade union is just an organisation of lots of different workers that bargain especially for higher wages, but also for better working conditions. In that sense, trade unions bargain collectively. They adopt collective bargaining. Normally, when individuals want high wages, they have to do so and bargain on their own, individual bargaining. But when individuals or workers are part of one big trade union, the trade union can bargain on behalf of all workers for high wages. So this term, collective bargaining, really is at the heart of what trade unions do. We're going to assume in this video that the trade union is a closed shop trade union, i.e. that in a given profession, all the workers are part of only one trade union. Other trade unions do not exist. One trade union has all the power, has all the workers behind it. In that sense, the trade union becomes a monopoly supplier of labour. The trade union will control the labour supply at given wage rates. That's very important. Let's now move to the diagram and understand exactly what trade unions do. What I've drawn here is a competitive labour market. We have the wage on the y-axis, the quantity of workers on the x-axis, as we're used to. We have a demand for labour, which is equal to MRP. We have a supply of labour, upward sloping, all as we are very comfortable with by now. Where demand equals supply, that's where we get our equilibrium, our equilibrium quantity of workers, the competitive quantity of workers, and the competitive wage. Fantastic. But obviously, if trade unions are getting involved here, they are not happy with that wage rate in the competitive market. The trade union will say it's too low for the workers that are working in this industry, they want to fight for higher wages for their workers. So maybe the trade union getting involved now will say, no, we don't want the wage at the competitive equilibrium. We want a wage of, let's call it WTU. That's the wage rate they are fighting for. But at that wage rate, there is a limit to the number of workers that are under the control of the trade union. And that limit, if we take that wage across, is there on the existing supply curve. That is the limit the number of workers that will be very, very happy with that wage rate. Let's explain. The supply curve of labour tells us the quantity of workers that are willing and able to work at different wage rates. So all of these workers below the black dot on this supply curve would be very, very happy with the wage rate WTU because they were willing and able to work for lower wage rates. So now at this wage rate offered by the trade union, they are extremely happy. So now they are under the control of the trade union at this wage rate. So the supply curve now essentially becomes horizontal up until that point. However, beyond this point, if the employer wanted to employ more workers, they would need to offer a higher wage rate. This wage rate of the trade union is not good enough for these workers to actually be incentivized to work. So beyond this black dot, to attract more workers into the firm, the firm would have to offer a higher wage rate, which means that the supply curve now reverts back to the original. So we can now extend it here. So what we have now is a new supply curve. And this supply curve, the black line, is the effective trade union supply curve. So we can call that the supply trade union. So that is the new supply curve that we are working with because the trade union is bargaining for a higher wage. Now, the trade union has a lot of power. Because of this closed shop agreement, you would expect that this firm would have to accept the higher wage. Why? Because all of the workers that are part of the trade union means the trade union has lots of power. If the firm rejects it, the trade union can organise a big strike. So a lot of power means that this wage is actually going to hold. Given this new supply curve, we can now work out the effect that this trade union is having on wages and employment. Well, it's very obvious to see that wages are now higher. So wages have increased compared to competitive outcomes. That's exactly what trade unions are all about. But a key question is what is happening to employment? This is where things start to go wrong if trade unions are interfering in a competitive labour market. What is the demand for workers now at this higher wage rate that the trade union is fighting for and has got? Well the demand is now only over there at this wage rate and that gives us a quantity of workers of QTU and we can see that, that quantity of workers, i.e. employment, is much less than competitive market outcomes, much less. And we can also see very clearly on this diagram that the trade union is causing unemployment. 
At this wage rate, the number of workers willing and able to work is over here, i.e. that's the supply, but the demand is only there. We see an excess supply of workers, and that is unemployment. So overall, when we consider employment, and we compare trade union employment levels to competitive employment levels, trade unions are actually reducing employment. For some workers, it's clear. So up until this quantity, QTU, workers are getting a great deal. They're getting a great wage, they're very happy, they're employed. But there is a difference. There were QC number of workers being employed in the competitive labour market, but now with the trade union, these guys have lost their jobs. They're not getting a benefit. At the same time, these people over here that were very happy to work at the trade union wage are not getting a job either. So it's wrong to say that for trade unions bargaining for higher wages, everybody benefits. Absolutely not. They are distorting efficient labour market outcomes. A significant chunk of people are actually losing out. This is a very inefficient outcome uh, that economists would say. At the same time, they are raising costs for the firm. They may well bankrupt the firm or cause some pretty lousy uh, situations for the firm, which may in the long run actually worsen the situation for workers. So bear that in mind, employment significantly reduced big arguments against what trade unions actually do, even though they might be successful in getting higher wages. So let's now evaluate, when it comes to an essay, let's evaluate uh, the impact of a trade union here. We've said that generally this trade union is not doing a good thing. It's making efficient labour market outcomes worse. But in evaluation, we can question that and say, if this trade union is impacting in a monopsony labour market, it's having an influence in a monopsony labour market, trade unions may be making things better, not worse. Why? Well, in my last video, you've understood what monopsonies do. They actually have wage setting power and can uh, implement wages and offer wages much lower than competitive labour market outcomes. And at the same time, employment in monopsony markets is much lower than competitive labour market outcomes. So if trade unions come in there and fight for higher wages, they could actually improve wages, get them closer to competitive outcomes, and they can increase employment. So that's brilliant evaluation, whereby here we said trade unions generally are not doing good things. In a monopsony labour market, trade unions could be actually improving outcomes and making outcomes more efficient. That's a very strong argument. You can watch my video on trade unions in monopsony labour markets to understand that fully. The link is just up here for you to go and click on. We can also question the strength of trade union power. It's all well and good saying that trade unions will always do this, but it depends on how powerful they are. Now we've assumed a closed shop trade union here. In the real world they are illegal. Um, so uh, in that sense, if they're illegal, trade unions may not necessarily have the same strength that we've assumed in this video. What we need to measure is something called union density, the proportion of the workforce in a given profession that are part of a given trade union. The greater that percentage, the greater the trade union power is, the greater the bargaining power the trade union has to fight for higher wages, the greater the control of the labour supply they have. Whereas the lower that percentage, the lower the union density, the less the power the trade union has in fighting for higher wages. So the lower the power, the less we can argue the distortion of the market will be. We can also uh, look at the union markup to work out the success of the trade union. To work out whether trade unions are actually increasing wages or not, union markup will tell us. The union markup is simply the difference in wage between what workers are getting who are part of a trade union in a given profession compared to what workers are getting in a similar profession but who are not part of a trade union. The bigger the difference, the bigger the success of the trade union, i.e. the bigger the union markup, the greater the success of the trade union is. So looking at the union markup, the difference between wages of workers in trade unions uh, compared to those who are not in trade unions is very important. And finally, we can also evaluate by looking at what the real world tells us. Real world evidence tells us that trade union power is actually significantly limited, especially since the 1970s, and there are some big reasons why. Maybe one of the biggest is how strict legislation has been since the 1970s against trade unions. And we can argue four key legislations. One is what I've already said. Closed shop trade unions are now illegal, which significantly reduces the power of each individual trade union. It limits the union density because now workers have to be spread around different trade unions. That's one key legislation. 
Uh, the other three link to striking. And we know that striking is one of the biggest weapons that trade unions have to fight against employers. But there are lots of legislations that have come in reducing how easy it is to strike. One legislation that came in is that now ballots have to be done in secret for strike activity to take place. No talking, only in secret. At the same time, strikes can only happen if at least 75% of members in a trade union agree to strike. That's a big percentage to agree. Otherwise, the strike is illegal. At the same time, you're only allowed to strike against your own employer. If another uh, set of workers are organizing a strike against their employer, you, being employed by a different employer, are not allowed to take part in that strike. And that, again, limits the power of the strike. So that legislation has come in, reducing the power of strikes as well. All of these legislations has actually meant that looking at real-world evidence, the trade union membership, compared to what it used to be in the 1970s, is much, much lower, reducing the power of trade unions. Very good evaluation, very good real-world evidence to go against some of the theory that we've said. The less the power of trade unions, the less they can actually do what we've said on this diagram. At the same time, the UK economy since the 1970s has significantly restructured, and that restructuring has again limited the power of trade unions. The UK economy has changed in two key ways. We've moved away from manufacturing and heavy industry related uh, jobs towards more service sector jobs. And in service sector industries, there are lots of different employers. Individuals will work for a huge variety of different employers, which makes organising trade union activity very hard. When you're not fighting against one big firm, let's say, you're fighting against lots and lots of different firms who will be offering different conditions and different wages. Much harder to organise trade union activity when that is going on. But at the same time, part-time work in the UK has become much more prevalent. And given that, again, it's very hard to organise trade union activity around it. So that restructuring of the UK economy has limited the impact of trade unions and limited the amount of trade union involvement, the membership of trade unions. And furthermore, since globalisation has taken over and the world has become one massive marketplace, competitive pressures have increased dramatically. And therefore, firms have got more power now to reject whatever trade unions are demanding, especially higher wages. They can reject it now knowing that if they do accept it, they may go bankrupt, they may lose all kinds of competitiveness gains. So that again limits the power of trade unions in fighting for higher wages. So all of these evaluation points are very strong going against some of this theory, going against some of the power that trade unions actually have. Bear this all in mind, hopefully now this all makes sense. Very interesting video. Thank you so much for watching guys. Stay tuned for my next very, very interesting video when we look at trade unions in monopsony labour markets. I will see you all then. Thanks for watching.